Segment three, the strike. 1984, the National Coal Board, which is the government body that oversees Britain's nationalized and heavily subsidized coal industry, announces that the game is about to change. Instead of subsidies without end <coughs> and accommodation with the unions without end, it intends to close 20 unproductive, unprofitable mines. 20,000 jobs will be eliminated. In certain towns in the north, virtually the only source of employment is about to come to an end. The National Union of Mine Workers is led by a man called Arthur Scargill. Tell us about Arthur Scargill and what he chooses to do. Well, in a way, Arthur Scargill was the best gift to Mrs. Thatcher because um, <laughs> there'd been a long history of confrontation <clears throat> with the National Union of Mine Workers. But before that, they'd been led by fairly moderate people um, who were very difficult to argue with politically because they had a sort of moral stature. Arthur Scargill was a hard-line communist, not actually a member of the Communist Party, but an ultra-extremist. And He also, called himself a Marxist, there was, as yes. I recall. There was yeah. no, uh, That's right. right. And, You're not casting aspersions. No, no. <laughs> and, uh, and he um, had a declaredly political agenda. He wanted to defeat and overthrow the Thatcher government. Uh, and he also actually had um, money which was later exposed from Soviet Russia and from Libya. So you were up against something that really was subversive of the political order. Um, but the Tories had had a history of losing on all of this. And indeed, Mrs. Thatcher herself had given in to the miners in 1981 uh, with a similar uh, comparable dispute because she wasn't ready. Mm. And uh, by this time, she was ready. She got the coal stocks prepared to uh, last out a strike. And she changed the law about picketing so that the, the uh, union could now be held liable in the courts for secondary picketing. And that made it much easier f to uh, uh, distrain the union funds. Let's, let's take a look at, yeah. at, at her response to Arthur Scargill and the strike. You talk about the ruthless, manipulating few. Now, will you not negotiate with them ever? I will never negotiate with people who use coercion and violence to achieve their objective. They are the enemies of democracy. They are not interested in the future of democracy. They are trying to kill democracy for their own purposes. Pretty tough. <laughs> the strike lasts about a year, as mm -hmm. I recall. Mm -hmm. And in the end, it just fizzles. The miners go back to work. Yes. Another great advantage Mrs. Thatcher had in this was that Arthur Scargill never had a ballot for the strike because he knew that if he did, he wouldn't win it. That's and why she gets to talk about an, a small minority of manipu manipulating it, the larger... Uh, exactly. Right. She always knew that, um, that he didn't have all the miners with him. And right through the strike, a third of them went on working. And as in the later part of the strike, that grew to half and so on. Um, but he called on union solidarity to, to make the strike happen. And of course, it was very dangerous, very hard going. And there was a point um, about halfway through where it really did look as if she would lose it. And, uh, but she, she pulled through in this knowledge that he didn't really have the legitimacy. And so though a lot of people hated it because it was all very tough and unpleasant and bitter, um, she did essentially have the moral argument on her side as well as the economic and political argument. And that was sort of tacitly acknowledged even by people who didn't like her. And once she'd won, everything changes. The whole, what, that's this, what, this, 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 this had lifted the incubus which had been on British governments uh, about trade union power. Uh, Falklands since war, the war in 82 gives her stature and in 84 she uses it. She changes Britain. Is that fair? That's fair. And in between she'd won a huge majority in the general election of 1983. Uh, and so she felt she had a real mandate. Mm. Charles, once again, this question of, con of t well, really the question of courage, an mm. old-fashioned virtue of courage. Falklands first. 1956, Prime Minister Antony Eden mm. bungles the brief Suez operation against Egypt in the Suez Canal, yep. and it ends up costing him the premiership. Mm. She knows as she goes to war in the Falklands that if that mm. fails... She's gone. Yes. There's a clear precedent in British history. Yes. Her government, her job, her entire everything is at stake. Yeah. She does it anyway. Yeah. And then we come to 1984 and this National Union of Mine Workers strike. Just a decade earlier, they'd gone out on strike with Edward Heath. Edward Heath had been a prime minister. Her predecessor is Tory prime minister. He had been putting in place some free market reforms. He'd been tough by the standards of the day. They bring the country to its knees and force him to reverse himself. Mm -hmm. And it costs Heath the government and the prime premiership. Yeah. 
she, within 24 months, she risks everything. Yeah. Twice. Where did this come from? This metal, this courage. Well, it, it's innate in her character, but it's also to do with the fact that she's that this point that she's all alone. So she knows that no excuses are going to be made for her if anything goes wrong. No, no, there are no pals to cover up for her, hold her in office after any disaster. Uh, she and she would always say this that you know a woman's only got one chance, mm. and. Um, uh, so, so in a way, she'd done what you're not supposed to do in politics, which is if you're in a hole, um, stop digging. She, it was in the hole and went on digging in, yes. in the sense that um, she knew only by playing the game as hard as you could, could you win.